Hello and welcome to You So You. My name is Zoe and this is my channel all about the crafty bits and pieces I get up to. I knit, I sew, I spin on a spindle, I dabble in weaving from time to time and anything else that takes my crafty fancy. But today we are looking at the things I've been working on in August. So grab a brew, put your feet up and let's get started. Welcome, welcome back to any returning viewers and to any new viewers, a very warm welcome to you. As I mentioned at the opening to the video, we're looking at the things I've been working on in August this week. Um, but before we get into that, let me just explain why this video is up on a Sunday and not a Saturday like I normally upload. <sighs> Had a bit of user error going on. Uh, essentially, this, this microphone here that I've started using in the past couple of videos it's great. It uh, means that I can be a bit more flexible with how far away from the camera I sit because I'm not using the one that's integral to, to my phone, which is what I'm filming on. Um, but the way it works is it plugs into the bottom of the phone and takes over the microphone for the phone. So um, I filmed yesterday, went through everything, got it all uploaded onto my computer, ready to edit sat down to edit, no sound. Eventually I'd forgotten to turn this bit on. Uh, so where the microphone takes over the, the one in the camera, in the phone, uh, <laughs> there was no sound on the, the recording at all. Now, this could be overcome if I had a microphone that recorded the sound separately. That's the system that TV shows and films use. It's why they use a, a clapperboard. Uh, if English isn't your first language and you're not sure what a clapperboard is, it's one of those. Um, so they have the, the, the motion and the sound to connect the two together and sync them up before you launch into the video. And I know some YouTubers do have that kind of a setup. I don't. Um, maybe one day, but I'm a little bit more slapdash at the moment. So yeah, so I'm having to, to re-record everything that I recorded yesterday. Um, so yeah, a little bit frustrating, but these things happen. So I have already checked that it's on. If you uh, look closely, you can see the green light. It's on, and you'll be able to tell that it's on because you'll be able to hear me. Uh, <laughs> so right, let's dive straight into things with what I am wearing. And this is the Bedrock Tea by So Liberated. It's one of my Minerva makes. Uh, in fact, all my finished sewing objects, my finished garments this week, are Minerva projects. So you'll find more details about them on my Minerva profile, which is linked in the uh, thingy down below. Uh, so this is a fairly thick 4A t-shirt fabric uh, jersey, which is, is great. It feels like one of those more expensive uh, t-shirt fabrics um it's in the pecan colorway it's one of the minerva core range and it's got a bit of structure to it a bit of shape to it the bedrock tea itself i've chosen to make view b in the short sleeves for this version it's a boxy fit so it's fitted around the bust and then boxy from that from there um so sort of a semi-fitted uh, version and there's a long sleeve version and a short sleeve version of this view. Then there's also view A, which also has a short sleeve, a long sleeve, and a sleeveless like vest style version. More on that in a bit. I, I personally consider it to be a completely separate um, view, but we'll get onto that in a minute. And that's a more fitted t-shirt. Uh, so you've got lots of variation within that one pattern, which I think is really good. It's why I picked that pattern. I do like the boxy shape, uh, but I do like a good vest as well. So I thought having the, the two in there would be would be good. Uh, view B has a high-low hem. So it sits around about the top of my jeans, just below the top of my jeans. So it's not cropped as such. And the back of the, the hem is a bit lower. So I like that fit. It's worked out rather nicely in this fabric. It's a nice smooth fabric. I don't think it's going to pill very much for a good little while um but yeah it's a bit more structured than some t-shirts so you can see that it's sitting with some folds and creases on me which is fine it's a t-shirt uh, but being a pecan color rather than your more typical sort of black and white is a little bit different 
Uh, so yes, we have an elevated basic t-shirt pattern with lots of versatility. So I'm pleased with that. Um, and this colour is a, a nice sort of slightly more unusual neutral. So it's going to pair nicely with most of the stuff in my wardrobe. Um, but yeah, not, not a, a basic white or black t-shirt. So that's my first finished object. And I'm going to move straight into my other finished sewing objects. As I say, these are all Minerva projects. I'll be putting the details uh, of the pattern and the fabrics up on the screen because I have used the same pattern for all of these. And I'll also be putting a picture up of me wearing the various t-shirts. So the second one I want to show you is the same view with the same options as the one that I am wearing. It's this uh, papyrus colorway. A uh, different jersey, also a Minerva core range. You can see where it's been folded, it's creased a little bit. That's because this is a lighter weight uh, jersey, so it's not got as much body to it. It's going to need careful folding, more careful than I did yesterday anyway. Um, the occasional press, um, possibly even hanging. Um, but this is a much drapier fabric, and this papyrus colourway, it's off-white, sort of a, a pinkish, peachish off-white. So again, it's not your standard white black tea i think white black uh, white and black for me can be a little bit harsh against my skin tone uh white in particular because i am pretty pale i mean this t-shirt is as close to a tan as i'm going to get um but, uh, this one being off white i think is a nice again basic going to go with most of the stuff in my wardrobe if not everything um yeah and i can wear these to work as well which is nice i have work in a pretty much a smart casual office it's an education uh, place, um, so it's, whilst it's not a school school, it's like a school. Um, it's like a primary school in a in this sort of level of formality of dress. Um, so yes, yeah, so these work quite nicely for that white place, paired with something smarter on the bottom, but they equally work well with jeans and jean shorts as they are in the photograph. My third Minerva project, also the Bedrock Tea. A little bit of a tale of woe. Now, I have this lovely old rose striped rib fabric. It's got a nice texture on it, nice bit of body to it. I thought, great, that'll do me a nice versatile vest top, uh, which I say the Bedrock Tea does. And it, that was quite pretty much what swung that pattern for me, that I could do this style of T-shirt and the vest style of T-shirts. Yes, Americans in the UK, we call what you call a tank top, we call a vest. What you call a sweater vest, we call a tank top. Um, <laughs> two countries divided by a common language. But, uh, yeah, so vest. Versatile object, good for layering. This is wearable. However, more user error. I took my measurements before planning which size to make for both versions of this t-shirt there are two different size charts in the pattern because of the different levels of ease to help you pick which size to make because it's not necessarily going to be the same for both t-shirts because different levels of ease i am not sure whether i misinterpreted how much uh, negative ease was in the pattern I'm not sure if i misinterpreted how much stretch the fabric had I'm not sure if I read the wrong part of the chart and was looking at the finished measurements when I should have been looking at the body measurements or a combination of all of the above. But I managed to cut out multiple sizes larger than I needed. I had inches of excess and um, me being me thinking, oh yeah, it's fine. It's just t-shirt. I'll sew it up and, and try it on the end. It'll fit. It won't be a problem. I finished the whole thing, argued with my twin needle, stretched out the neckline, um, had to put a massive amount of steam onto the hem and the armband and the neckband to get them to lie flat, having used the twin needle, which I rarely use, to get a professional clean finish on the garment. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I, I was able to take in the side seams. It has meant that... Uh, the, the side seams are not as smooth as they were before. There is a slightly odder shape. I had graded as well between patterns to accommodate my generous lower half. Um, 
So yeah, so the side seams are not as smooth as I would have liked. The um, bottom of the arm side is a little bit higher than intended, which has its pluses, because it does mean that any bra I wear is not going to show under the arm, which does irritate me a little bit. But it's a little bit higher than I'm used to for a vest top. Um, it's, it's not uncomfortable. I, I've still got range of motion, so that's all fine. Um, on this side, down the, side, the seam, my pattern matching has been retained despite the taking it in by multiple inches, so I'm happy with that. On this side, however, the uh, for somehow I've managed to, to dislodge the stripes. Um, they were lined up before I took it in by multiple inches, so I'm not quite sure how I managed that. Um, the neckline is slightly wider, but maybe like sort of half an inch too wide, so the, the straps sit it slightly wider on my shoulder than I would prefer, which is not the biggest issue in the world. Um, you know, the, the outside sits on the point of my shoulder, so that's fine. Um, but it does mean on the inside, the bras that I wear, at, I'm covering up the microphone, that's a bad plan. Um, so yes, yeah, so the outside edge of the strap sits on my the peak of my shoulder, which is exactly where your, your shoulder seams should sit on a sleeved top. So I'm okay with that. But the inside edge, I would have preferred it to be maybe half an inch further in towards my neck. But doesn't I mean there's not much I can do about that now, particularly having altered the arm sign. Um, just to make sure that the bras that I'm wearing at the moment, so they're like crop top style bras, are completely covered by that neckline. Um, that would be my preference. I mean, that's a minor issue. When I do finally get around to finishing the toile off my bras that I'm going to make and their straps, I don't think it'll be an issue at all, depending, of course, on, on where the straps sit. Um, so, yes, yeah, so a minor niggle there. And where I've stretched out the neckband, it doesn't sit particularly smoothly across the front. And no amount of steam on my existing iron has managed to fix that. I do, however, have on order a new uh, steam iron, one of those fancy ones designed for, for people who sew, um, that like lift up off the, the ironing board when you take your hand off and have the, the tip for bias binding and that kind of thing. Um, so my um, 20 plus year old iron that is on its last legs and leaving marks and all sorts, um, it, it, it's getting replaced. So maybe the new iron with, with its better steam function will be able to fix the neckline, maybe it won't. Um, the other options that I have is I can just live with it because I mean, it's a layering piece anyway. Um, so if I'm wearing it to cover the midriff between the bottom of a crop top and what I'm wearing, which is something I do sometimes do, um, then that's fine because it's the bottom that'll be showing. Um, if I, it's the top that's showing, we'll have to see how much it annoys me. Um, I could take a couple of little tucks, like one at either side, just by the straps um, and make it look intentional, um, but that's going to disrupt the stripe pattern. I could take the tucks in the centre Again, make it look intentional, but again, it's going to disrupt the stripe pattern. Or I might, and this is this is the most likely option that I would take if I get round to it, assuming the new iron doesn't fix the problem. And that's to put some elastic into the neckband to just tighten that bit up and make it sit a bit more smoothly against my body. Um, I think the chances of me actually getting around to that are fairly slim. So, so yeah, so slight tale of woe. It is wearable. Um, it is a layering piece. It's going to to be underneath shirts and things that are like open at the front um, or underneath crop tops just to cover that middle bit that I don't particularly feel comfortable having out on display all the time. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Um, I, I mean, I like the fabric. <laughs> I like the, the pattern. I just messed up. Um, yeah, I will be making more once I work out what size to cut out and I will be making more of this view as well I mean I might possibly make the long sleeve version for autumn winter I don't think I'll be making a sleeveless version of this one because you attach a band to this drop shoulder point here um, and I'm not sure that that's drastically different to to the short sleeve um, I don't I don't think it's something that I have a particular need for in my wardrobe I and mean, if it was a just off the shoulder and finished maybe here 
maybe because that would be a significant difference but yeah i think it's more likely for me to stick to, to this option this this blend um in various different colors and fabrics and have that in in rotation in my wardrobe because i can see these being in heavy rotation because they are so versatile because they will go with pretty much everything that i i wear uh, and because i can wear them casually as well as wearing them to work uh, it's it's a good mix for me um, I'm also thinking I could put a patch pocket on the breast to, to jazz up the, the pattern if I wanted to. I could put some beading maybe over the shoulder and the neckline, little embroideries on the sleeves. There's all sorts of things you could do to jazz up this elevated basic t-shirt pattern. So yeah, really pleased I made that choice. Um, so yeah, so that's my first set of finished objects. As I say, there will be more information on the bedrock tees that I've made on the, my Minerva profile. Those posts all went up yesterday, so they are there now. Um, well, yesterday as I'm filming, <laughs> a couple of days ago, for you as you're watching. Um, so yeah, so that's sewing finished objects. And let me show you what I am storing them in. Uh, regular viewers will have seen me make this. This is a My Own Two Hands project. It's the shopping basket, which comes with the, the willows and a video course to do it. I am hoping, I am planning, at some point to buy a second kit and have another go see if i can do a better job because this is not the best basket it's not bad for a first go i have to say um it's it's uh, wider at the top than i think i was supposed to do it um and it's it's not particularly evenly shaped not everything is uh, beaten down as firmly as it should be but it's functional and it's going to be storing my hand sewing projects and my my quilting projects my cross stitch projects those sorts of things for the time being i think it was 33rd street knit so Teresa, who said it looked like a good knitting basket i totally agree i do have another basket that has my knitting and spinning and crochet projects in at the moment and um, it's a shop bought um, basket um because the ones that i'm actively working on at the moment are quite small and they fit quite nicely in that if i was working on sweaters those project bags would be better in here um so yeah, so that's my, my wicker basket. And you're yeah, definitely, definitely going to try and make another one at some point. Um, my uh, let's move on to another finished object, um, which is also a bit of a tale of woe. It's been a bit of a month. Um, so this, I've got it in, a tr in my lid of a shoebox that I've been using as a beading tray. Now, uh, this is a kit from the bead shop in Nottingham. If you are familiar with Nottingham, you probably know where it is. It's just off the market square um, up towards the Theatre Royal. A nice purple building. They do tea and cake as well as, as beading. Um, and they do mail order if you're not anywhere near Nottingham. Uh, this is the vintage lace necklace, which is beautiful. comes in a few different colours. Uh, it's a nice sort of art deco feel to it it's a fairly simple kit to make up um certainly more simple than it looks like when you look at the picture of it uh, this i think is the hematite option i think that's the one i went for um so yeah not difficult to make apart from when you put on the necklace ends so this bit now in order to do that there's a little tube that you need to clamp down onto the thread that you've uh, beaded onto, which is a nylon um, invisible thread. I mean, it, it won't, it really won't show up very well uh, on camera. There's a bit of black fishing line there, but there's also some clear, uh, more plasticky nylon beading thread as well. So you clamp this metal tube down onto to the threads and cover it with the, the necklace end. Now I thought, thought I'd got this right and I have at this end this end is fine um now the necklace itself is probably a little bit short for me so I was trying it on just to see if I needed to to get a longer extension chain for it um and as I opened the clasp to do it up the bit that I clamped onto the thread just came off with a whole chunk of the bead um because you have to cut thread once you've clamped it on i don't have the skills to fix that without completely taking it apart and starting over and um, so that's a little bit of a tale of woe um, but it is a nice kit 
Uh, there's just that one tricky bit for attaching the, the necklace end at the end that I, I yeah, didn't quite manage. Uh, but like I said, I think the necklace is probably a little bit short for me anyway. Um, so I will uh, look at it again at another point. Do you know, I'm just looking at find the, see the box of it just out of camera. It wasn't the hematite version. It's just, just called black. There is a hematite version. I think that might be slightly more grey. Um, and they do a full range of colours. They are very quick to deliver if you are ordering from the bead shop in Nottingham online. Um, I do recommend them as a, a mail order supplier for beading kits and beads. And they do needle felting and they do macrame. Um, if you're in Nottingham and you need a necklace, a beaded necklace mended or a, a bracelet mended or something like that, that's something they do as well. So yeah, like that shop. Okay, so let's move on to something that's maybe slightly less of a tale of woe. Let's talk enameling. Uh, again, regular viewers will have seen a couple of weeks ago that I had a go at cold fired enameling using uh, resin powder. Um, there is a learning curve with this and I will be doing some more because I've got the stuff, so I'm going to use it up. Um, so my first attempt, I didn't, I didn't collect on long enough because I, hopefully you can see through the camera I and mean, there that side the counter enamel is all completely rough which is not too much wrong it's the back and um, this side the pink is actually quite nice and smooth and glossy but the blue is is still rough so I, I, I clearly haven't let the blue melt long enough I think that's probably because I did the front first the pink then I did the back so when it's got enamel on one side, you put it on a little stand. So it's a little bit further away from the heat source. Um, so I maybe need to leave it longer uh, when I'm doing the second side. Uh, the other piece that, that I did um, has worked a little bit better. So the counter enamel is quite rough. But the front side is nice and smooth and glossy. So yeah, so there's a learning curve. I will, I say, be doing more of the cold enamel technique with the, the little stove that I've got that works with tea lighters um, but somebody mentioned on that video about torch fired enameling using real genuine glass powder enamel um, so I thought, okay I'll have a little look into that and uh, yeah I, I can see the the appeal of, of using torch fired instead of a kiln um, because the kilns are expensive and they take up space which I um, don't really have so torch fired you're using like a little kitchen blowtorch or a jeweler's blowtorch to fire the enamel. That's very appealing. You're playing with fire in a controlled way. Now, whilst I was researching torch fired enamel, I fell down a little YouTube rabbit hole um, I, of something that I don't know if I'll ever actually get around to trying, but it's mesmerizing to watch, and that is torch painting copper. So you're using the flame from the blowtorch to change the color of the copper and create patterns it is seriously mesmerizing to watch if you've not come across it do check it out on youtube uh, it's sometimes called flame painting sometimes called torch painting um, but yeah it, it uh, plays on the fact that as you heat copper it changes color in a specific order to the point at which you stop heating it that's the color that you get yeah fascinating um, so yeah do check that out on uh, on youtube um, but back to things that I've actually finished. Let's take a look at some buttons. Last month I showed you some Zvernov buttons, which is a continental European style of thread wrapped buttons. Um, so you get your shirt laces and, and that kind of thing. They're all Zvernov buttons. They're done on flat rings. Um, I've gone back to doing some Dorset buttons. So again, regular viewers will have seen me do Dorset buttons before. And I've been playing with some different threads to see which I like for for the buttons so that I can do more of them. So this is a Dorset cartwheel or crosswheel, depending on what terminology that you use. And this has been made in a quite thick silk, so it's quite quick to do. I'll show you how thick that is in a minute because I've got another button that's made with the same um, silk. The only issue with this, this silk, although it's nice to work with, you don't get a lot of yardage in your skein. So um, not ideal if you're making loads of, of buttons. I've done another cartwheel here in a much finer silk. So you can see how fine that is with the tail there. So that is 
again it gives a lovely finish but it actually takes quite a while to do because the thread is so fine um so that's not ideal if you wanted to make lots of them if you're just making one or two then using the fine threads is absolutely fine um but yeah it will take you a bit of time the other finished buttons that i've i've got are yarrels which is a slightly different style of dorset button they're made in much the same way um but they look like this and this is that thicker silk so you can see it's actually quite a chunky silk um so yeah so quick to work with so again if you're making just one or two absolutely fine but um yeah i, I could only make the two and i didn't have enough to leave a tail on the cartwheel um which is not a problem because you detach them as separate thread anyway I just find it quite easy to pick them up when they've got a tail on, so I tend to leave the tails. Um, so yeah, so a nice silk to work with, just not the most practical for making large numbers of buttons. Um, this is another Yarrow, and again, the thread is not particularly practical. This has been made in a, a wool, a pure wool. You can see how fine that, that wool is there. It's like a, a tapestry type wool. Um, again, it's a Yarrow. Um, again, it took ages to do because that thread is just so, so fine. Um, I think a fingering weight yarn would be fine for making this size of, of button. So if you've knitted up a cardigan and you wanted to use the same yarn for your buttons, that would work. Um, the other yar yarrow that I've done, I quite like this thread. It's not as thick as a fingering weight. It's probably closer to a heavy lace weight. Um, so it's a good sort of balance thickness of, of uh, thread to use for these buttons again it's a yarrow and this has been done in dmc cotton perle which i had left over from the zvanop kit and the only other one that i'm working on is not quite finished yet so i'll just sneak it in here because it's only the one of them so I'll sneak it in with the finished objects rather than going to the the works in progress i'm just going to take my needle out of the way so again we're working with a fine silk and I've just got that far, so I'm about to decide whether I'm going to do a cross wheel or a yarrow um, or something else in the middle there. So yeah, it does take a bit of time when you're working with those thinner threads, which is why I really don't understand how the people that were making these as their living made so many in a day. They had a, a, a quota that they had to make, or they they couldn't eat, and they were doing they were doing smaller ones, and um, so less thread required per. Um, button, but even so, when you're using a fine thread, it takes time. I, I'm amazed that they managed to get them done as quickly as they could. Okay, so I think that's all that I can technically class as finished objects. Um, so we'll move on to works in progress, and we'll start with picking up from the end of um, the video that I did on dyeing yarn and fibre the other week. I did say that by the time I made this video I would have started to spin up this fibre. So this is the this is a 50 gram a lot of Polworth that I dyed up. I dyed up two of these. Um, so that's what it looks like before spinning. And I'd like to grab my recycled bag that some socks came in. Uh, commercial socks. Um, not that I, off I don't often wear commercial socks. But we're going to the Peak District in a few days and we're going to be doing a lot of walking. So, yeah, I bought some commercial socks for that. Not that I can't walk long distances in my uh, hand-knit socks, but the weather's been a bit warm. So commercial socks, I think, will be a bit cooler on my feet. Um, but anyway, back to the spinning. So this is how my Polworth is spinning up. Now, I've not spun up Polworth before. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I am enjoying it. Um, so yeah, that's the bump, and that's the spin. There are lengths of orange and red and blue in in the spin as well. Um, so I'm about sixty percent through the first lot of fifty grams on this spindle here. So I'll get this spun up. I'll get the other fifty grams spun up, and then we will see uh, what they're like when they're applied. So yeah pleased with how that's turning out so far. Ugh. Just pop that away. 
I know the plastic bag rustles, but uh, I need to keep it away from the cat somehow. Okay, so the other dyeing that I did was I dyed up two 100 gram skeins of merino into this colourway. And I said that I would have them swatched by the time I made this video. So I caked up one of the skein. So that's how it is in the skein. That's how it is caked up. And I've not blocked the swatch, but I do have the swatch. Um, so yeah, this is how the colourway is knitting up. So I am going to be dyeing some more of this colourway. Or at least attempting to dye up some more of this colourway. Hopefully I can replicate it. I did write down what I did. Um, so yeah, the aim is to dye up some more of this so that I can knit up a sweater or a cardigan, some sort of garment in this colourway. Um, I have the, the yarn already for that, I just need to get it into the dye pots um, and decide which pattern I'm going to use. I have about seven that I'm choosing between. So by the time we get to the what I've been working on in September, hopefully the uh, sweater quantity of yarn for this project will have been dyed up and I will have chosen which pattern. I'm going to use because that will tell me how much I need to dye up. Um, so yeah, and I, I also need a name for this colourway. What do we think? Anybody got any suggestions for names for this colourway? Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the dyeing. Um, so I'm classing those as works in progress because obviously the spinning is part way through and because I'm going to be turning that yarn into a, a sweater but, uh, yeah the only other work in progress I have to show you is actually a sneak peek to next week's video so if you don't want any spoilers you've been warned so I have been working with some air dry clay now in the past you've seen me work with polymer clay which is the one that you bake in the oven and is not food safe when I was at school, when I was about 14, 13, 14, that kind of age, uh, we actually had at, in our art room a, a pottery wheel and we had a kiln. So I was able to do a little tiny bit of hand building and throwing in ceramics and terracotta. Um, I made like a, a little bowl on the wheel and I hand built a vase and hand sculpted a little rabbit with glass eyes in terracotta that was very very cute but i don't have any more i think it got broken in a move many years ago and um, so ceramics that you fire so things like stoneware and porcelain that kind of thing they're food safe polymer clay not food safe air dry clay as the name suggests you don't need an oven for you don't need a kiln for it just dries of its own accord but it is also not food safe. It's also not waterproof. Um, I believe you can get some varnishes and finishes for it that will make it waterproof. Um, but generally speaking, air dry clay, not waterproof. So none of the other stuff that, you want, that you're making with it is going to want to go anywhere near food or drink or water without some form of protection. So I have made, I'm in the process of making a little trinket dish. This will be for holding my stitch markers and that kind of thing as I'm working. So I am in the painting process of these at the moment. So we've got the base color or the base white base coat, the base color on, um, and we're ready for maybe second coats of the outside and a bit of detail work. And I've made a matching little bowl. So this will probably have yarn sat in it when I'm working on it. Um, possibly the little bumps of fibre as I'm ready to spin. But like I say, I might need to do a another coat on the outside and there is detail work to be done. Um, and then they'll leave varnishing. So to see more about how I actually made those uh, air dry clay pots, that'll be next week's video. I'd love to see you in that one. But until then, there's this video on screen that may be of interest to you. But until then, happy crafting and bye-bye for now.